thank you for being here. I'm actually, well, I guess we'll acknowledge we're on the Sinaiq's lands, I believe, and it's always a privilege to be here. And also, it's especially a privilege to be here because I haven't really seen anybody in, in since March. So um, it's really just nice to be able to be in a room together because I think we learn better in a group. Uh, so I'm just going, I want to thank my colleague Gay Tan who did bring all of these mobile wall assembly. There's wall, there's roof, and there's subfloor. And at some point we'll you'll have an opportunity to look around, look at them. They are all described on Hamid's website, which we will provide to you, but each each unit is very well described on his blog, and at times today, hopefully you can have, have a look at them. So, uh, our agenda today, well, BCIT is, it will be the main uh, focus at 9.30, they'll be zoomed in, and then uh, afterwards we have a, a Michelle DeLuca is a local energy advisor, she'll give us a little, uh, a little presentation and then sort of question and answers about Castlegar and RDCK and the rollout of that coach. Oh, okay. I just wanted to briefly tell you who Community Energy Association is, we're a not-for-profit society, we work we, it's an auspicious day because it's our 25th anniversary today and we came out of a memorandum of understanding with UBCM and the province to support local government in all things energy and efficiency uh, or to do with reducing energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and it's our privilege to work in the community. We have many members who and I, I put your, all your logos there because I wanted to show you that the city of Castlegar is a longtime member of the Community Energy Association, showing your sort of commitment to climate leadership. And, and other members are, are there. I also, just before we get started, wanted to talk about the climate, uh, the, the Partners for Climate Protection program. That's a program with FCM. Uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, the City of Castlegar is a member of that program and again just showing leadership, showing uh, sort of it's a, it's a network of a number of municipalities that believe in taking climate action. There's a milestone process. City of Castlegar in the corporate has reached milestone one and in the community because you have a community energy plan we call the SKEEP. Uh, you've you've reached uh, milestone number three. And uh, CEA, myself and my colleagues, can certainly help Castlegar work through those, and the RDCK work through those um, milestones. So that's just a little, a little plug for your, you're a member. Uh, we welcome you and we can support you if you want to go through the, the milestones. And now for the step code. Just to give you some, some background on the step code, uh, in 2017 we had the Building Act, which uh, was revoked to, they, what they wanted was all municipalities to have a uh, consistent approach to building in the communities. So that was the Building Act, then in the, in the 20, we've now got the Climate Leadership Path, and Plan and Clean BC. So these are some of the initial provincial leaderships to set the stage for the BC Energy Set Code. I just wanted to go through um, how the Set Code works, just to very basic. But you've got the you've got the uh, initial. So you've got the the building code as it is now, and builders can use the performance pathway or the prescriptive pathway. They're kind of used to using the prescriptive pathway. The BC code is introducing the performance pathway, which for step one is working with an energy advisor to model uh, your home and understand how its energy is used. Step two and three are actually achieving 10% or 20% better, work, always working with the energy advisor, but achieving a higher energy efficiency than just the, using the prescriptive pathway or the kind of the former building code. 
Step four is 40% better, and step five is known as net zero ready. The province introduced in 2017, introduced the energy code, gave us a map to show that in 2032, the end goal is to be net zero ready for all, uh, all new homes built in BC in 2032. So the stepped approach is to avoid that rude awakening of the industry to wake up on the morning of 2032 and understand that they have to be doing things completely different. So it's a stepped approach with a number of years in between to get us to 2032. This has been published as what the steps look like. So they're already announced that in 2022, which is now only two years from now, all part nine buildings will be required to be step three. So we've got these two years right now to sort of start learning how to work with an energy advisor and using the performance pathway of the building code. And, uh, and then part three building, uh, the timeline's a little bit slower. Again, so to be the, using the performance compliance rather than using the prescriptive to part, part 936 of the building code, rather than using that, the prescriptive, you're now energy modeling with the Natural Resource Canada uh, Certified Energy Advisor, and you're doing the blower door air tightness test. And Michelle's here today uh, to um, talk more about that. We also have, uh, at this point in time, there's two Certified Energy Advisors very close to Castlegar. We have Michelle out of Nelson. We have Stephen Doyle in Rossland. He was unable to uh, join us today, but we will certainly provide you with his particular what the energy step code measures and we're going to go into that in a lot of detail but it's envelope efficiency equipment efficiency and it's performance based this is an older slide but just an indication of local governments have already referenced step code in their bylaws in some cases starting in December 7 2017, they were starting to reference the step code. And um, this is what we know about the local area for addressing, or have, have already put, put step code in their bylaws. So the city of Nelson, as of last August, required step one, which is working with the energy advisor. Uh, so that's now, if you, if you get a Part 9 building permit in City of Nelson, that's a requirement since last summer. They haven't announced, as far as I know, they haven't announced the date that you have to actually reach Step 3 yet, unless you know Michelle, but Not yet. I think they're, they're working on the bylaw. So all of, and say, same with Rossland, they now, if you pull a building permit in Rossland, as of February, you need to be meeting Step 3. RDCK is, hasn't quite adopted their bylaw yet, but their timeline for RDCK and all of the villages that are in, the, um, in their service area, it's expected to be December 2020. And again, part step three, we don't have, um, we don't have notification yet. And then consulting, I know, so what that means is you submit a letter to the BC, uh, <coughs> BC Step Code Council, and you just say, oh, we're, we're consulting, like workshops like this, and the builder's breakfast tomorrow, and within City of Castlegar and RDCK, we have done lots of promoting uh, workshops over the years, but you've actually announced at the provincial level for Castlegar, Creston, Regional District of Kootenai Boundary, and some of the villages have all said, yes, we're consulting, we're considering doing this. So Castle Gar has done that. I'm just going to run through uh, Fortis, BC. Thank you very much. They have provided uh, provided this event today, and uh, they have some rebates. And I think Paul, you're going to speak a little bit more, but probably after the thing. But uh, Fortis, BC does have rebates available. Uh, this is very complicated and. Uh, I think I'm gonna, I'll get you the link to this so you can read it more thoroughly. 
but they've upped their uh, amounts. And so now if you actually have worked with the energy advisor and built, you've got the documentation to say you've achieved step three, supporters will give you a $3,000 check back. Uh, if you achieve step five, it'll be 10,000 back. So that's some of the rebates that Fortis is giving out right now for new homes. And of course, rebates will only be available until in this period. Once this becomes law, there's no incentives. You know, you just, you'll have to build to what the, what the code says. You won't. There won't be any incentives to build that way. Uh, a little bit more about the design offer. That's their website, which I'll give you that link. And that was going to be the end of my presentation, which gives us five minutes to set up for um, the BCIT uh, live. And we'll move into, after, after BCIT, uh, Michelle will be providing a little bit of information on the Energy Advisor. And I think that's... I think that's what we'll do. We'll uh, we'll switch gears now. So thank you for your attention, and let's go to the next show. I'm kind of working uh, quite in depth with Fortis and BC Hydro on various different kind of funding streams and, and things. And as Michelle said, there's um, Fortis have just kind of come out and doubled up essentially um, rebates for new homes and existing homes. So they've they've called the uh, rebates for the existing homes, the double up program. So it's kind of um, boilers, uh, insulation, windows, all that kind of stuff. They've essentially looked at what rebates they were giving and doubled them for this period. So um, they're really trying to encourage us to go through and do that retrofit because there's a huge commitment to retrofit up to between 60 and 80% of the homes that we have in existing in BC. We have to get them up to the standards that we're starting to build for step code. So it's really important that we start doing that. Um, and kind of other news, I got uh, some information from Fortis yesterday, which is very applicable to you guys as building officials. Um, and it's on like HVAC training. So it's kind of raised that um, HVAC is one area that uh, we don't necessarily know as much as because it's not been as much of a priority. Um, so Fortis have kind of worked with the, let me get that name right, wherever it is on my little bit of paper, a HVAC training provider, um, and they're reducing the price up to 80% of the cost. So we can send that out to all of our building community and our like, energy advisors, and the costs are reduced by 80% because Fortis are covering that. Um, for you guys as building officials in the RDCK and our kind of municipalities, I have funding from Fortis as part of this Build Better training to cover that 100%. Um, so this is a plethora of courses. I think there's 12 different HVAC courses from kind of introduction all the way up through to design and um, implementation of like hydronics and all that kind of stuff with CPD points, importantly um that we can provide for you guys for free so um yeah it's really worth looking into i have the information i think i sent it to the rdck guys hopefully you guys got the email and then we'll circulate it around to the everybody else so um it's it's all part of this kind of working together where the rdck and the municipalities together um and sharing our resources getting everybody on the same page with the same kind of training so yeah Lots of good stuff going on and money on the table. Things set up. I think everybody can hear Alex. Alex, okay. Everybody can hear you, Alex, and we can okay. we can see you in miniature. So okay. why don't you okay. say hello and uh, when the IT fellow comes and when I see him there, he can project you onto the big screen. So it's okay. yours. Awesome. Okay. So good morning, uh, everyone. Alex here. I'm. Uh, uh, at the BCIT campus in Burnaby right now. Um, I'm here with uh, Mary McWilliam, Vanessa Alzati, and uh, James Bourget. And so you'll spend a few minutes with me and you'll spend most of this morning's session with James and I'll be the, I'll be the camera person behind the scene. 
uh, and we all are, uh, we're all located inside a space that we refer to as the High Performance Building Lab. It's a large classroom at the Burnaby campus that is used for hands-on teaching about the energy step code. Uh, and we have about an hour and a half together uh, in the lab uh, to get you through a few concepts all associated to the, uh, the new DC energy step code. Um, Trish, I think what I'm going to do um, is just make sure we're using the same language. I know you guys are aware of the step code, but James is going to keep going from Teddy to ACH. So I'm just going to make sure we're all on the same page and take two minutes to kind of refresh Absolutely. everybody's memory. Absolutely. Okay, and cool. everything is working now. You're on the main screen okay. now. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So we'll get, and we'll give you a better uh, a better uh, view of the space. We have all sorts of wall mockups, practice walls testing houses and so on. Um, so, okay, so we're together this morning. Our intention is to discuss some specifics uh, of the energy step code. Uh, what is the energy step code? It's, a, it's a, a, a regulation in BC that was implemented or enabled about two years ago at the legislative uh, assembly and it's been moving slowly towards us in the municipalities. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a piece of uh, legislation that is asking for all buildings to be uh, near or net or near net zero energy by 2032. Uh, and it has defined what we mean by near zero or near net zero with um, three metrics. And so you should be familiar by now or you should soon become familiar with uh, three acronyms, the uh, TEDI, uh, the MUI, and the ACH. And, and those are the three metrics that have been chosen to define uh, the, the, the progress of a building towards a near zero or a near net zero energy. Uh, the TEDI measures how much uh, heat energy is required to keep the building uh, warm uh, in uh, the winter. Uh, the uh, MUI measures the energy consumption of the mechanical system, so the heating and cooling system, uh, the domestic hot water, the ventilation, and, and the uh, auxiliary equipment such as pumps and fans. And then the ACH measures uh, the air tightness um, of the envelope. And they're all related, they all have an impact on each other, so they're, they're very important uh, uh, in different ways, but they're all uh, as important. And so we're trying to get our houses or our buildings from uh, where they are today to uh, near net zero by 2032. Uh, it's measured with three metrics, the TEDI, the MUI, and the ACH. And it's called step code because we're not going to get there with only one step. We're going to make multiple steps between now and then. So we have to be near, uh, near net zero by 2032. Uh, there are five steps between uh, you know, day zero and, and day uh, 2032. Uh, step one is a building that is very similar to what we know uh, today. Step two is slightly more efficient. Step three will become mandatory in every municipality by 2022. So some municipalities are, are saying, hey, let's start with step three. But the reality is everybody will be at step three by 2022. Uh, it's going to be uh, mandated. And then we're moving to step four by 2027. And then step five, the, uh, the higher steps uh, by um, 2032. So uh, we're in the lab at BCIT. As I said earlier, we're here to talk about the energy step code. Um, I have James Bourget, who's a, a principal at RDH Engineering, uh, that is also a part-time instructor here at BCIT that will kind of walk you through uh, some elements in the building that are all associated with your TEDI and with your ACH. So I think James, you're gonna start, start with air tightness and ACH, and then you're gonna to move towards TEDI, and I'll get back on camera at one point to talk about the view. We all show an HRV and a heat pump. Yeah, and that's, then the, that's we'll accurate. Get, get a tour. Okay, so we're just, as can we hear James now? Everybody can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, good, so yes. you're good to go. So we're gonna switch. Well, I can hear Kalsadar. Uh, we can hear you, James, and, and thank you Kalsadar. for performing. I can hear you. Thank you for confirming. Okay. Mary Swan. Uh, air tightness. And I have this correct. Council is looking at uh, introducing step one and going into the step code process. 
So air tightness has always been a code pattern, but you need a continuous plane of air tightness in the code. The difference now is it gets tested and it, it accountable for those results. So I'm going to take you through an air barrier. An air barrier is basically like a balloon wrapped on all sides of your enclosure, the six sides of your, let's call it a cube for simplistic with all kinds of cool atoms. So that needs to be continuous through the windows, the penetrations, roof to wall interfaces, framed wood to concrete, along the concrete slab on the bottom. And how can we get that achieved using what we use on a regular basis? And the interesting thing is everything that we need to accomplish the lower steps, one, two, three, we're already on site. The only thing missing is a plant. So okay, behind me, i got a couple of mock-ups, and I'm just going to do a high-level review of how some of those things connect together and need to connect together. So behind me here is just a standard little two-by-four frame wall, vented attic, little insulation inside there. We have some bad in the walls, and your basic, uh, let's call it a, a two-by-six, you know, R16 wall out of the British Columbia building code. Down here, I have the concrete foundation, which is simulated, and I have a, a, a membrane or gap proofing or whatever is required. I then have a self adhered membrane, which is a water resistor barrier. So this coating connects to concrete. This barrier connects to coating. This tie back and tape connects to the self adhered membrane. The tie back and tape is an air barrier system, it's a CCMC approved system for air tightness. As long as you make the tapes very well, you have now this concrete is connected to this tie back in a continuous manner throughout the envelope. So you'll see sometimes uh, in this approach, this is an exterior air barrier approach. Up above here, as the water resistor barrier carried up, you see that it's not taped because your plate of air tightness doesn't go into your vented attic it runs along your ceiling plane. And therefore, under the standard construction premises, that air barrier is the polyethylene ceiling. I'm sure you can imagine the challenges with all of the clockworks, plumbing stacks, the service walls, uh, the connections of T walls and the shear connections. You look at the partition walls on the inside, you know that polyethylene flap that they put between the plates that's half hanging out and all over the place. That's actually your air barrier connection. And each should be connected to that polyethylene you put on your ceiling. So how do you make all that happen effectively? That's part of what we do here is show process that is effective. So that you have the same tape, poly, pooky, which is my pet name for acoustic seal, okay? Already on site, but when installed, the purpose is extremely effective or can be as an air barrier, particularly in the lower steps. So behind me here is another one. This is an exterior insulated roof. And the same thing here, where the air barrier on this one, you see this air barrier tape receiver? This tape, and I'll try to explain that. I'm gonna move over to a little mock up here. But as I talked, this had to carry to the polyethylene. I'll show you here on the back side. So if you have this tape, this tape connects this plywood to this plane. Wood is an air barrier. You can't blow through a two by four. You can't blow through the half inch sheeting. So if I connect them together and I take this tape to that tape, this tape is connected to that concrete. All by connections, all the way up. All in the standard course of construction. Once it's connected to this plate, any joints in this plate where it ends, I just put a piece of tape across it. So this plate becomes a monolithic monolithic ring around your home. On the inboard side, you have the acoustic seal and the polyethylene. So if that is all connected to this plate, and this plate is connected to the acoustic seal, and the acoustic seal is connected to the polyethylene, it carries along and comes down the other side. So you now have a continuous connection of standard components installed in an air barrier strategy. By default, currently under standard practice, that polyethylene ceiling would be the, the real red herring 
of a bill. Now, you can do an interior air barrier where you simply seal all of the polyethylene on the inside of the enclosure. This is very challenging. You have numerous receptacles. You have kitchen cabinets. I mean, if we be honest with ourselves, how often have you seen kitchen cabinet rails go in without a whole bunch of holes? All the holes that you make on the inside are holes through the air barrier. The rotos hit when they cut out that drywall and a piece of poly falls out. That's a giant hole in the air barrier. So the trend is to put the air barrier on the outside because it's much more manageable and much simpler to do. And so I'll take you to the next mock up. In this one, we have the same exterior air barrier approach, okay? But we've changed the roof assembly from, it's no longer a vented roof, but it's an exterior insulated roof, okay? So the air barrier is actually this membrane up here. But how can I connect this membrane to that concrete down the bottom? I do it the same way as I come up the wall, and now I have the same air barrier tape here. But when you come and look underneath here and the blocking that takes place, I've connected my Tyvek tape and tuck tape to this SIGA tape. If I seal here, which is similar to what you do with cellulose walls and all the rest where you seal the back framing, I've now connected this concrete, membrane, connect, 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 connect. Connected now, that plywood is now connected to that concrete. So when this sheathing is installed, if at this junction right here, a connection is made, and I use a two-sided membrane, and I put a, a dab on top of each truss cord at this line down the run, and I put the plywood on, I'm now continuously sealed right to this plywood. All of this is very simple to do. It's just a matter of being aware of what you need to do. I mean, we build circular staircases. We frame all kinds of crazy stuff. This is all really simple stuff. It's just a matter of being aware of it. So once you get that plywood here connected to the concrete there, I have a self-adhered membrane, like peel and stick, let's call it that for simplistic purposes. And that goes on top of the plywood roof. This Attic space is now conditioned space. You can use attic trusses. Make a part of your condition space. It can be an upper loft, a playroom for the kids. You can put your mechanical up there uh, and uh, have a, another basement, uh, another room in the basement. When you start doing the envelope and making the envelope more efficient, your mechanical needs start to shrink. And there's some real benefits to that moving forward, but I'm not gonna go there right now. So this self adhered membrane that's installed here is serving as my water resistant barrier, my air barrier, and my vapor control layer. Three functions in one. So the takeaway from that is the tie deck here is working as a water resistant barrier and an air barrier. This is working as a water resistant barrier, air barrier, and vapor control layer. But we have one product doing multiple control functions. It's not a linear equation. So when you're looking at the assembly you wish to choose or build, uh, my suggestion is you keep it simple identify the control layers and know that one product or system of products could function for multiple different control layers. Once you understand the control layers, you look at the four Ds of building science, which is deflection, drying, durability, okay, and drainage, um, you're starting to get the nine things you need to develop a good envelope. Five control layers, water shedding surface, your cladding, water resistant barrier, thermal barrier, air barrier, big control. Once you understand these five things and apply them across every environmental separator, which is what your enclosure is, it's simply an environmental separator. And these things do exist in some form or another. Identification of these things and knowledge of material properties will make you one of the smartest people in the room. And the next best decision will be made by default through simple analysis. Okay. So on the table here, and they want to give you 15 minutes to talk about a topic they go on for hours and hours and hours, so I'm kind of zipping through here for you. So there's a few things that are on here, but let's take, for example, a penetration, a duct penetration. 
if I have a duct penetration coming through this wall here, how do I make it part of that air barrier system right here? One of the things that I really like to use is an unreinforced EPDM membrane. So this is a four inch duct. You note how this flange is onto the duct and creates a clamp on it. If I wanted to, I could actually tape that. The difference between taping this and what I commonly see is you'll have an annular penetration coming out of the wall, right? And then somebody with a roll of tape takes a linear element and tries to seal an annular element. Well, you start to see that that's a little bit silly if you want to get to any kind of performance level. It's more of an HP type approach. What I mean by HP is the open fray, okay? Not really a good approach, okay? Okay, PP is a good approach, a purposeful plan, okay? So stay away from HP, go with the PP, okay? So you have a nice seal on here, but you think, well, that's hard to make. Well, actually, no, it's incredibly simple to make. You can take top off any aerosol is a perfect template for a four inch duct. So all of these things that you need to do are very, very practical. You can take, place it on your membrane, trace around it, no problem. Take your knife, Take it out. And then you simply, when you put these onto, onto the ducts, you simply roll them on. A little hard to hold this thing on the table, obviously. <laughs> Great. easier when they're mounted. But the point is, I have a very, very tight seal. We air test this seal and it's extremely effective. If you're doing an interior air barrier and you have a whole bunch of receptacles, which you do, they all need to be airtight because they connect to polyethylene, but you have a poly path, which is a, is a lovely concept, but it's a good time to be honest with yourself. As the electrician comes, makes his hole for the wire, how does that get sealed up? No matter where he makes that hole, I'm just doing this to be representative. You put some magic pookie there, so when you're doing the wire work and rest, this stays tight? No, it does not. This becomes a blind application. One of the things that I caution is whatever you do in an envelope, try to minimize the amount of blind work you do. Everything should be done that you can see. And that's one of the big advantages of an exterior air barrier. Let's say you do a polyethylene air barrier on your home. And under the step code, it's advisable and going to be required that you get a mid-door blower test. Okay? So the drywall's not on yet. And you do it, you get a great test. So then after that test is done and you get your polyethylene and your fiberglass or whatever insulation inspection, the drywall, which is sitting on the floor ready to go, happens. And what happens at that point? Here comes the knife. So, do you think drywall has ever cut polyethylene to make boards fit? Uh huh. Do you think uh, rotosip comes out once in a while to, I don't know, provide an extra opening? Uh huh. What about the windows? When I started drywall, we didn't have rotosips. I got gray hair, see? I've been around a little while. Um, we used to cut the drywall because uh, we knew where the window was. It was pretty simple. Now, is boarded rotozip. So what happens to the polyethylene around the window when you rotozip? If you're honest with yourself, it becomes damaged. Well, if you're going to make an air barrier, that polyethylene needs to be integrally connected to your window because it's also part of the air barrier system. So remember we talked about making connections. No matter if you go inside or outside, you may make a connection. If you go back to this, if I have a window here, my tie lip will wrap inside the opening and I'll make that connection with the rotten cock on the inside. So now that Tyvek is connected to the window. That window is connected to the concrete. It's all connected. And all that's on site. 
It just needs to be done with purpose. I mean, I've seen peel stick membranes staple up. That doesn't make any sense. It's a P and S membrane. That's peel and stick, not peel and staple. You can do the same thing here. Electrical box. You can undo it. Right on the same gasket. The whole idea is you can see the return on the rubber. So this was a four inch, I got a two and a half inch hole. That gives me a three quarter inch return on each side. So if you just dimensionally drill a hole or cut a hole, when I get these smaller sizes, even to a uh, everybody's favorite LV, low, low uh, voltage wire, how many times have you seen this come through the polyethylene with the great big blueberry wrapped around it? That blue vapor barrier tape. Well, all the time. It's not airtight. You can't put tape around that airtight. It becomes HP again. The other part that's incredibly interesting is you don't need to seal your vapor barrier unless it's the air barrier. So that tape, the blue tape, is only certified as vapor barrier tape. It hasn't been certified as an air barrier tape. So this is kind of the status of the industry where everything's just a little bit mixed up. So, and that's where I strongly suggest you keep it simple. You learn the systems, the control layers, and you can build anything you want simply to the passive level. So James, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna turn to Mary, can you hear me? Okay, so, so we have to keep track of the time. We said- I'm gonna go thermal now? Yeah, step code is three metrics. Yeah. Air tightness. Check. Air tightness, and now we're gonna move over to thermal. And I have a Energy. question for you, James. Yeah. Why, why do you always start with air tightness in your presentations? Well, because of all the things that I need to do to meet the step code, the most cost effective, simplest, and friendliest approach to give me the biggest bang for the buck is air tightness, okay? The tighter I make my building, the less I'm gonna spend on mechanical, thermal, windows, because it's a combined metric of energy use, okay? So kilowatt hours per square meter of energy use, if you heat up air and you let it leak out of your envelope, you have to make up that energy loss with your other components. Plastics, tapes, rubbers, and common sense, to me, is a cost effective approach to a very good start. So let's look at some thermal, okay? Thank you. I'm gonna take them around over to this side, so hopefully everybody can follow. You're following me to that? We'll let it come on over this way. Then. I'm just gonna close here before I look at that insulation. This is a penetration wall that I put together and I do smoke testing on this. This is showing a wire penetration through the rubber using a putty to seal that wire because you can see it's a 14-2 wire. It's not an annular element. It's like two annular elements shaped like a figure eight. So I use the putty, the rubber locks around it because you'd have a little weak leak right here. Well, this putty, which is on the table here, and I'll just grab that quickly. But you can use fire stop putties and all of this kind of stuff very malleable material, and you massage it in there, and it's just there for good. And again, super simple, right? A, dot, a vent penetration, a hose bib, note the rubber wraps around, note the LV, rubber wraps around. Here's uh, penetration to your plate. If you have a polyethylene on uh, your ceiling, and you have the mechanicals coming through it, you gotta seal that to connect to that polyflop because it's part of your bed. A simple foam injection takes care of that nicely. Again, there's the electrical. So behind me here, I got a few things here and I'll try to uh, talk about. With this approach here, you can see that the insulation is on the outside. We have a simple inch and a half layer of insulation. This would be a split insulated wall assembly, which is vapor open. So the vapor control on the back side is on the warm side of the insulation, which is what we need in our climate and the wall can simply dry out this way. So this could be an R22 wall, two by six grading. These are just mock-ups, excuse me, just mock-ups uh, to show the concept of the build. And what we do in the lab is we go through the process. How can you actually do this work effectively? So you can see here around this window, I have a layer of insulation, but note how the insulation encroaches on the window frame. That's extremely thermally efficient because I don't have those losses, heat losses around the window because this window frame that is part of your thermal of your envelope, that's thermal for your envelope and they're connected. Thermal continuity. Uh, CI is a term you'll hear, that means continuous insulation. That's what you want to do. But then you think about 
Well, how can that window drain? Well, show you over here. So by putting in what I call insulation infills or headers, I can drain from the subsill through the insulation and out this point here. I used to have a neat water bottle, but I don't have one here right now. And I could demonstrate that it's very, very effective. So this is simply a very fine Brillo mat, which provides that entry of water on the backside. Should water get into this building envelope? Note here on this insulation, the insulation is set back from the opening. And the reason for that is windows need a rough opening so that they are allowed to rack and interstory drift and all that other neat stuff that has to happen. But the one I showed you the first time, if I place my window at a certain depth coming out, I can have the insulation plane over the frame. It can still rack behind and it slips behind that insulation. So I get all the thermal and I get the racking ability. So where you place your windows has a huge bearing on what you can do for thermal effectiveness. And that's the benefit of this type of window, which is flangeless or clip type windows, because now you have variability of where you want to put your windows. Okay. This is our little turnstile we developed here. Here is multi-layer. I have three layers of XPS uh, sitting right here, okay? So three, five, R25 wall, just with the insulation, you add some of the other uh, air films, etc., and we're, we're greater than that. I could change any of these two, two, and two would be six inches. Doing the same assembly, I'd have an R30 wall. You don't really need to go much farther than that. There's a diminishing returns on R value on walls. You go to R100, you're not getting any benefit. You're just getting a really big wall. But you're not getting a lot of benefit when you start looking at the combined metrics of energy, okay? The window's your weakest leak. You know, fiberglass or uh, low conductivity frames, triple E or three triple glaze with two low E coatings. This kind of thing is an approach that you spend a few bucks on a good window which is your weakest leak. You make the savings on your walls and mechanicals because if you get airtight as good windows, you're well on your way to addressing the most critical or most beneficial components of energy conservation for your build. And so these are good decisions to make. You can see here with this insulation, everything compresses perfectly flat and this all flattens right out. But this provides a very small capillary break, which allows if I put water here, it drains out. So I can have my window insulated. I can have subsill drainage because you have to be aware that windows may at some point leak or water may get there and has to be a way for it to get out, uh, can easily get out. I put on a simple siding. I have a nice little flashing trim detail. You can do a, a wood return detail, whatever. For teaching purposes, I just try to keep it simple uh, because I can pre-make this to get the message across. And you have an extremely effective thermal barrier that drains both at the head on the flashing and at the sill. I can dress the sill flashing right here, knowing that it's draining underneath the sill flashing then would be functioning as the more powerful the deflection. Water's not getting anywhere near here if it's deflected away. So that's a good way to look at that. So, so, so how am I making out on my time? So time wise, how are we doing? Five minutes? Five more minutes. And okay. then James will have questions for you. Fair enough. So the wall assembly here is a exterior insulated wall assembly. All on the outboard. This is a low permeance insulation. If you're going to use a low permeance insulation, starting to do split insulated wall assemblies with low permeance insulations or combinations of permeable and non-permeable insulations becomes tricky business. And in my mind, an unnecessary tricky business because you can build everything you need with either permeable or impermeable by choosing the appropriate assembly. And, and James, can you just take a step back and tell us the name of the materials we're seeing on this wall and, and, and maybe go a bit further by defining permeance, uh, vapor permeance for us. Okay, this is uh, XPS insulation. So okay. this one can be pink, it can be blue. Well, it can be blue, pink, bellini, very nice color. Um, can be a bleeding insulation, but, but the point is, 
is impermeable to vapor or it, re, it has a very low permeance, it means it cannot let moisture dry through in vapor form. Okay? It also is highly resistant to water. So if you have moisture behind here, it can only dry to the interior, which is okay. But I'm going to close with one thing that, that's really, really super important, okay, with respect to kind of ties in both your air tightness, water penetration resistance, and your thermal efficiency is if you put insulation on the outside of your wall, and if you, if you plan it with a split, a stuffed back, or something like that on the inside, or if you do an open cell spray foam, whatever, if you put insulation on the outside, and you put the air barrier into a sandwiched state, your air tightness, okay, becomes very, very good because you're sandwiching that membrane. It's called a sandwich membrane effect. At RDH, we do a lot of studies of that kind of thing. We find that even a loose laid Tyvek, for example, if you sandwich it down hard, the air tightness gets better. But let's look at moisture. These insulations, mineral in particular, is hydrophobic. If I sprinkle water on there, it beads up like car finish. During the courses that we do, we build these wall assemblies and we test them. And then we put them in a spray rack and we can test them to E1105 testing and, and put them across 500 pascals of pressure. You know, we're, we're talking you know, hundreds of kilometers an hour winds in a rain event with open joint cladding and we water test them. Worse than any home would ever experience. And then we take them apart. The biggest benefit that I find after doing this over and over and over for a long, long time is I have yet, after any test, ever seen one drop of moisture on the membrane. It can't get through the insulation with the rain screen pressure monitoring cavity. The key is the rain screen. There's no pressure to pull it through. And what little drops do come hit the insulation. Well, it can't get through two layers of insulation because the joints are stagnant. So by default, you're getting better air tightness, water system penetration goes through the roof, you, it won't leak, so you got all kinds of forgiveness, and uh, your R values are maximized by maintaining a, a little bit of a thinner wall, yet a little bit of a build out, so you got this really attractive looking wall. It doesn't look like those flat walls we're so used to seeing now, right? And the, uh, the other benefit is the, re, uh, the, the reduced condensation potential. Why? Because if you put insulation on the outside, I refer to that as a warm sheeting wall assembly. If you have warm sheeting, it won't reach too far. So uh, room, 20 degrees Celsius, 50% humidity, the dew point, if that air touches the surface, less than eight degrees, it'll change from vapor to liquid, condensation. If you have warm sheathing and you put the insulation on the outside, that sheathing is the same temperature as your kitchen counter. I don't think you have condensation on your kitchen counter. Yet, you have all the other benefits of putting it on the outside. And the more you put it on the outside, the more perfect your wall gets. So as you move forward, and there's projects I'll be talking about, and another one is like a passive house in Bella Bella that we did, uh, a two by six wall, six inches of interval on the outside, some uh, bad insulation in the studs. And there's this plaque on the door, it says certified passive. Two by six wall. Does everybody know how to build one? Uh-huh. Do you need to build a crazy wall? Uh-huh. Can you build a crazy wall? If you want. Would it make sense to practice all these skills and processes on a simple wall? Probably. Why not start with a two by six wall? Or I'll tell you what, when I started training, and many of you may be listening, we didn't need a two by six wall. Do you know why two by six wall became the norm? Because the code wanted 15 or 16 R16. And it was found that if you stuck that in a two by six, you got 15.6. And they said, ah, oh, close enough. That'll work for code, okay? Before that, it was a two by four wall. What happens when you go to 22? Do you build a two by eight wall? And then a two by 10 wall, call all your friends to help you lift it, but you still got a cold sheeting wall. So if you build a thick wall with cold sheeting, you better have a really good air barrier because that sheeting is cold. And the more insulation you put in it, the colder it gets. So the condensation potential of risk rises. Put it on the outside, keep the sheeting warm. You get all the benefits that come with it and the process. You can pre-make much of this in your shop before you start. You can cut all your window papers. You can cut all your insulation headers. And that's part of what I do is take you through the process of efficiency because it says all this costs too much. You cannot judge cost if you don't have a process. You can't judge cost on a concept. If I showed you effectively how to set up crews to manage, cut, and deliver this to the wall for insulation, you'd be amazed at how fast it actually goes. And if you put all the insulation on the outside, 
and nothing on the inside, that means you can start drywalling right away. All your mechanical, electrical, everybody has three service cavity walls to work on. Do whatever you want on the inside without affecting any of your control areas. These are all the considerations as you move forward. So I think I've heard that in five minutes. Yeah, so James, I'm thinking, okay, I started the morning by saying energy step code is real. It's a stepped approach. It's a performance-based measurement of what a near or near net zero energy house would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said we are doing a performance-based code by using three metrics. Everybody will have to have an energy model of the house, and they will have to tell the computer, this is my PID, this is my ACH, and this is my MUE. We started with the ACH, which is a measurement of how airtight uh, the building is, and you said, hey, your airtight uh, or your air bear can be on the outside, it can be on the inside, yeah. It can be both on the both. inside and the outside. Yeah, 12 air barriers you want. Yeah. And, and, and I think it, you said, you know, make sure you have a plan because it's actually not complicated, no. but you need a plan. Yeah, and, and that's exactly correct, Alex. Right now, everything you need, and you guys are looking at step one. The thing about step one is so wonderful is you simply report the value and you learn the process. Uh, and everything you need to, to meet step three air tightness is already on your site, on everything you build. With a little bit of planning and a little bit of control, you can make that metric easily. And I work with builders uh, on the side and I do training on their job sites and give them a couple pointers. And the last one I did on a complicated home, they are heritage type looking home, uh, he got 1.8 on his first attempt, only with a few tips along the way. He was thrilled, the homeowners were thrilled, and he used everything that he normally uses. So, uh, we're going around on yeah, that. So we're, I'm going to show them. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say one more thing with you that I'm going to go and talk about the mechanical systems and then you and I will do a quick tour of the house. Um, so just to kind of help me with my little brain here, you got us through air tightness and you said, you know, at one point you'll have to hit a certain target that uh, means your house is very airtight mm -hmm. uh, and this is how you do it. Then you move to the Teddy, which is the second metric of the energy step code that is really a measurement of how well insulated your house is. And you said, this is a split insulation wall. This is why I like the split insulation wall. It keeps it my sheeting warm. It adds a layer on my WRB, which tends to increase air tightness and increase uh, the quality of the moisture control. Yes. Now, you also said you can get your um, the ticker wall uh, with a two by eight. Maybe a two by ten. You can do a double wall. There's all sorts of way you can you know go about it. It's a it's a it's performance based code, so yeah. people get to choose. But we like to teach around the split insulation wall because of all the building science um, you know that we know is pointing towards this wall being a smart wall. Well, it's a good starting point, and a split insulated wall keeps the sheathing warmer. But if you put all the insulation on the outside, it keeps the sheathing really warm, toasty warm, cozy warm. No issues of condensation, water, and you just don't have any problems. And so here we try to get everybody to start with what you build now. How can you make that a little bit better and subtly change it? So imagine if you built a two by four wall and you put a layer of insulation on the outside called a sweat. When you get a bit cold, what do you do? You put on a better sweat. And if you go up north, it's really freaking cold, you put on a parka. So you just put another layer on the outside. The concept is very, very simple, and you get all the benefits of it, okay? And so there's a metrics or three of them, but it's an envelope first code. So the air tightness and your thermal, your teddy, your envelope is the starting point, and you supplement after you've done that with your mechanical. And I think Alex is going to go on a mechanical run now, are you not? Alex, are you yeah, okay, I'm ready for mechanicals. All right, so, so I take I, your word, Alex. I, I, I wasn't paying attention to the last thing you said, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry. I think you I think you were wrapping up uh, talking about the envelope first approach. That's what that was my takeaway there. It's an envelope first approach supplemented by the mechanical after you've mastered your envelope. And, and, and really, if you think about it, uh, you can't have uh, great walls that are airtight uh, without a good ventilation system. It, it makes sense, but really, what makes even more sense to me is is the uh, opportunity uh, cost of not building a good envelope right away. Um, I can 
uh, make somewhat easily some upgrades to my um, mechanical systems over time to go in and reopen my walls or remove my cladding or remove my drywall and rebuild my wall it is, is very difficult to do, not cost effective if it's done as a retrofit. So why not invest in the envelope right away and, uh, and keep our options open for later? So uh, we said energy step code is performance based. We said it's a measurement of uh, uh, house performance to measure if it's getting close to being net zero or near net zero energy. And we said we will measure the uh, air tightness with ACH and we will measure the uh, quality of the insulation with PEDI. And that's the envelope first approach. But there, there's a third metric that we absolutely have to talk about. It's the MUI. Uh, it starts with an M because it means mechanicals. Uh, so MUI, uh, the acronym means mechanical energy use intensity. And it's a measurement of how much energy is needed to run your mechanical systems uh, in your house. It includes uh, the electricity needed uh, to run uh, any ventilation. Uh, it includes the electricity needed to run pumps that would be circulating water. Uh, it includes uh, the energy needed for your heating uh, your cooling and the heating of your uh, domestic hot water. Um, so what I'm going to do in the next five minutes is I'm going to spend a few minutes on, on the HRV uh, and then a few minutes on uh, heat pump, which are uh, two of the elements that I think you'll hear the most about uh, in, in the next while. Um, the HRV is another acronym that stands for heat recovery ventilation. Uh, some of you guys will be familiar with the, the system. They are not new. They've been installed in Canada for more than 30 years. Uh, but what you'll see is more and more uh, use of uh, what I call high performance HRV, so high uh, efficiency or high heat recovery efficiency, uh, because the uh, other good bang for your buck is definitely around recovering all the heat you can when you do your uh, ventilation. So I'm not sure on camera, can you see the color of the lights? So, so we have a bit of a, a science exhibit behind us that explains what the net zero house looks like. And the camera is looking at the HRV right now. So I'm not sure if you can uh, yeah, read. Yeah, we can uh, see the lights. What, okay, cool. So, uh, so here I have uh, uh, an arrow uh, that uh, shows that I have warm air, so red warm air coming back from inside the house, back into my HRV. Uh, and I'm exhausting that air to the outside and it's now blue. And it's now blue because I have a heat exchanger inside of my little box here that is transferring the heat to the cold air that is coming uh, back into the house through my fresh air supply. So I have cold air uh, passing by, not touching, but passing by uh, warm air, it gets warmed up, and I can bring uh, fresh air inside the house at a fairly warm temperature. Some of these uh, systems can recover in the 90% neighborhood, uh, and so you could uh, be in a situation where you don't need to spend a lot of energy reheating the new fresh air that is coming uh, in uh, because you have a high efficiency uh, heat recovery system. Uh, the beauty with these systems is that they also are useful in the summer so I'm just reversing the process here. I've uh, invested some of my money in, in cooling the house. Uh, I have to exhaust uh, the air because the CO2 levels are getting high. Uh, it's cold air that is going out. I have July, mid-July warm air coming in. I don't want to pay twice to cool it again. I do a heat exchange. And so the air that I bring inside uh, my house is uh, to a fairly cool temperature which means I don't have to pay twice or pay a full amount to get it to the temperature I need again. So you will uh, see uh, through the energy modeling, uh, uh, HRVs are uh, becoming the norm and the high efficiency heat recovery is gonna be something that you wanna look into because you can get uh, your MUI and your PEDI uh, hit them more easily with high efficiency HRVs. So that's one thing. I'm looking at the other camera now, I think. Um, what I wanted to show you, and I'm not sure if you'll have enough uh, cable, uh, Mary, um, for the HRV, there's gonna be two main distribution systems you're gonna see. There's gonna be the traditional uh, metal uh, ductwork that's gonna be uh, done in a way that you have your main distribution lines to your room and you have splits that are providing air uh, to different zones in your house. And if you follow me to the other side, 
you'll have a different uh, kind of system that uh, doesn't use the metal duct as a distribution. It uses a flexible plastic pipe that is actually uh, uh, done in a way that every uh, room has its own distribution. So instead of having a, a larger trunk uh, that has lots of air that slowly distributes the air to every room, I have one uh, run for every room. So there's some advantages and uh, disadvantages to both. Uh, this one can uh, be uh, full of friction, so you might uh, have some problems getting the airflow you need, so you have to do commissioning, you have to do balancing. The other one is a bit more complicated to make sure you have the flows distributed through the different splits, so it's also very important to do your commissioning uh, and do your uh, balancing. So that's for the HRV. I want to make sure we have time to spend, uh, uh, I want to have time to go with James around the house. I'll just quickly show you um, the other piece of equipment that you will probably hear more and more about. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a heat pump. Um, it's, a, it's a mini split, a ductless heat pump. Um, it has a, a, a compressor system that is installed on the outside. And I don't know, Mary, if you can come with me, um, but it has, uh, different configurations for bringing heat or bringing um, uh, cool air uh, to different rooms. So this one has a wall-mounted uh, header. Uh, the uh, ductless systems can distribute the heat through the floor, through the ceiling, or through the wall. And, and, and what is nice about the heat pump when it comes to uh, meeting your MUI is that uh, the heat pump is not in the business of creating heat. So my baseboard heaters are in the business of creating heat. I, get in the electrons to flow through a resistance, and, and that creates heat, and I can heat my room. The heat pump says, hey, I don't want to create heat. I want to take heat from somewhere and move it somewhere else. And so what you're uh, doing with a baseboard heater is for every unit of electricity you buy, you're getting one unit of uh, heat energy. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, and that's because creating heat is not an easy thing. So the best you can get for one unit of electricity is one unit of heat. Uh, the business of moving heat is much easier. I only need one unit of energy, uh, sorry, one unit of electricity to get up to uh, three units of heat. And so I can uh, get my MUI and my energy step down to a much lower level because, again, for three units of heat in the house, I can use as, as, as few as one unit of electricity. So um, we talked about the MUI. Uh, we talked about the Teddy with James. We talked about uh, the uh, air tightness. Let's try to put this all together, looking at a little house that we have inside the classroom here. And James will do that very quickly because we would like to have time for discussion with the participants. So we'll do a quick, uh, just a quick walk uh, uh, around. And what I would like you to do, James, if you don't mind, uh, is is quickly. Uh, Put what uh, the, the the students see on the screen in, in perspective with what you showed them this morning. Mm -hmm. So tell us on each wall what is the air barrier, what is the Teddy strategy, and and, and point to those details that you uh, showed us. Okay, and I have a couple minutes, right? Okay, we're looking at a, uh, a rain screen wall assembly here. This is a a VP membrane, which means vapor permeable. It's a self adhered vapor permeable membrane. Commonly sell here membranes are like fuel sticks and they're vapor closed. They make also vapor open fuel sticks. This is like a three foot hole of tape. It's quite an effective air barrier. However, it has a little trouble bonding to wet wood. Wood dries out quickly, but if it's damp, it won't bond well. This is a typical rain screen wall assembly. We got the simulated wood metal cladding uh, just for show and tell. This is the air barrier, water resistant barrier. It's connected to the window by way of rod and caulk, uh, sealant on the inside. This wall thermal barrier will be on the interior and the vapor control would be on the interior also, uh, whether it be uh, polyethylene or uh, vapor barrier paint, a uh, smart barrier, but vapor control will be on the inside, okay? As we come over to this side, here you see something similar to what I showed you on my mock-ups where we now have an exterior insulated wall assembly with an XPS vapor closed type insulation. This again is a rain screen assembly. It's quite thermally efficient. This uh, assembly in itself, this insulation provides your thermal, okay? 
uh, there is no vapor control on the inside because this does provide that. So you see that there's a breathable membrane there. So this wall has only the potential to drive to the inside, okay? Alternatively, you can use a vapor closed membrane on this wall assembly where everything stays outboard. You can see the wall assembly here. You see some of the details that take place. You can see the, uh, the rubber gasket making the air barrier type. We've used the loose laid air barrier and water resist barrier, which is the Tyvek. But note the sandwich effect. It might help to really visualize that if you get this or mineral wool or any kind of insulation sandwiching this down, the only place that this membrane leaks is if you put a fastener hole in it or the tapes. What I have found that when I run the students through a window install and I do an air test on it, there's always some air leakage and smoke comes through. And you know where it comes from? The tape. Because the concept of taping, it, it's, it's presumed it's magical, right? You put the tape on, go like this, and it's airtight. No, you have to, it's pressure sensitive. So the time needs to be spent pressing it down. As you come across here, okay, we have, this here is R7.5, we got two of them. So basically it's an R15 looking at the outside on this here wall assembly. Oh, another thing that's uh, kind of a neat approach is insect control and that. Commonly you'll see the nylon screens and all the rest of that. Um, we like to use a uh, perforated aluminum. Uh, you can buy sheets four by eight, they're easy to make. Uh, this wall assembly is a split insulated wall assembly and it's got the mineral wool bat inside it. What's really important is the insulation ratios, okay? You, you, need, you need a one-third, two-third type rule is not a bad place to start. 50-50, uh, there's talk about that too. But what I'm getting across there is depending on what climate zone that you are building in, what the interior conditions are, what the occupant loading is, all this stuff has a bearing on what that is. But the bottom line is you're playing games with ratios. You don't need to do that. On this side here, I believe this one was a double stud, if I remember correctly. And again, we have a similar sheeting membrane here. This is a, a, a SEGA. Again, it's very vapor open. I think it's upwards of 50 perms. You can see the air barrier continuity here, which is kind of fun. So I'm going to take you on a little from the bottom up approach here, okay? So down at the bottom here, we have simulated, say, a concrete foundation. The peel stick connects to the wall. The Tyvek starter is started here. This was uh, just as a, a starter showing different membranes. It could be this one connecting here, but the point is, this is connected to this, connects to this, connects to this, connects to this, that's connected here. And as you come up the wall and you get to the underside of the space here, we have plywood on the underside and it's taped. Taped plywood is an air barrier. There's no problem with that whatsoever. So the thing about plywood that's really interesting and, and needs to be understood is it's one of the few materials that has a variable vapor permeance. So if it's subjected to a, a high humidity environment, it becomes vapor open. If it's subjected to a lower humidity environment, it's a vapor retarder. So it can actually be used as a vapor retarder on the inside because that's a lower humidity environment, okay? Um, and so that's what this is doing here. Uh, you can see that the, uh, there's some mineral wool on the outside. So we're trying to keep the sheathing a little bit warm uh, and having a, a thermal continuity to this assembly. You can do split insulated floor, which this is. This is a insulated wall assembly. So you can do lots of different combinations. But the key is this house is just to show you a whole bunch of things. When you actually do your building, especially if you're starting out uh, at the step one range and you want to develop process, is pick a process that makes sense for you and your teams or your trades and master that. And again, it's a simple build with a, a split insulated wall assembly can take you to pass it. If you master that, then try a different one later if you want. But there are costs and processes that negate this conception of, oh, it's all too expensive. There's trade-offs. Put the insulation outside, 
You don't have anything on the inside, so you don't have to do the, the poly, the bat, and all that pookie and all that sealing. You don't have to do anything. You start drywall and start the kitchen cabinets once and once they have moisture barriers on the outside. Somewhere on this side. Oh, I can't go that way. We ran out of cable. It's not uncommon I go off on a tangent. I just walked in an opposite direction. Here we have a uh, exterior insulated wall with mineral wool. Okay, so the vapor control is on the inboard side, the warm side of the insulation. This wall assembly can readily dry out. Water can't get through the mineral wall. The layers are staggered. Uh, the window sills are drained, similar to what I showed you in my mock-ups here. You can see the balcony membrane here. The reason it looks like it does is because we have a removable base of wall detail. One of the things that's really, really important is if and when, because it's coming, and we start to insulate and do warm sheeting approach, you have to consider renewals. So it's one of the things we teach in some of the course here is renewable base detailing. So I'm showing various options of how that can be integrated where we can change that balcony membrane without taking the cladding off, just simply remove the uh, renewable base of wall detail. And so there's a removable collar that's all made with, you know, insulation and little straps and all that. You can take it all off, redo the membrane and put it back on. That's very, very important because you imagine if you have to do this without doing that, you've got to cut into that whole enclosure. Uh, that can be challenging. But to do this kind of work, that's part of what we do in the High Performance Lab is show you step-by-step -step processes that are simple, believe it or not, that you can achieve this. The problem is it's not thought about. You take a simple slope roof, for example, I'll just do one last second here. Right now, if you put insulation on the outside and you mount that closure flashing up at the top of your roof against the wall, you're going to take a significant reduction in your energy efficiency because you've done a thermal bridge. The key to net zero ready and passive and high performance homes is not only understanding the materials and the processes and developing them, but is to build with thermal bridge free construction, or at best, greatly reduced. So if you have an, a sidewall and you have a cross cavity flashing running across that wall and you have exterior insulation and then you put that flashing metal onto the wall sheeting itself, you can kill that wall by 30%. All you have to do is put the flashing onto the insulation. So what I tell a lot of the people I work with, when you start putting insulation on the outside, don't look at it as insulation. It's just your new plywood. Just treat it like you would the plywood before you ever did this. If you look on the house behind you here, that mineral wall, just imagine in your mind, it's the plywood sheathing. Strap it for the cladding on. There's no difference. It just looks different. So that's what we're doing here. Um, you're starting with a step code, and that's fantastic. Uh, others have already embraced and moved up the step code ladder, and are finding that these processes and that are actually not challenging at all, only different. And back in the, uh, in the 90s, when down here in the coast and now we introduced you know, rain screen strapping, told that the industry was going to be ruined and you can't do that today it's commonplace so it's the human way but change is good don't they that's so, all i have uh, so trish and the team in castle guard uh, i was thinking maybe we give james a, a stool so that he can uh, maybe take a short short uh, rest and uh, we could start a discussion it's always a bit of a challenge with that whole online uh, piece. I promise, uh, James, by the way, I would do like we do in the sitcoms. I would have laughters and applause when he uh, is funny or says something <laughs> smart. Because right now, we don't know. Maybe you guys were maybe you guys were at the coffee machine. Who knows? But, You're uh, getting radio uh, silence. <laughs> I, I was um, chuckling in my corner. Thank you very okay, much. Good. Thank you. I, and I can I can tell you it's been an interesting morning for us. We had the police, we had the fire truck, we had two contractors walk by. Like it's been quite a yeah. quite a dynamic morning at our end. But uh, yeah, so maybe over to you, Trish. Okay. Well, hello. Oh, can you can you see us actually? No. I can see you. Oh, hi. Yeah, we hello. see you. We see you, Trish. Okay. Hi. It's hi. weird. I see you on the screen on my left, but I have to look at a camera on my right. So it's like, hello. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, and behind me is essentially the uh, city of Kafagar and regional district of Central Kootenai representatives and one energy advisor. And, Excellent. And yeah. you're very near and dear to my heart. I grew up in Nelson, so yeah. I am a Kootenai boy, and that's me. Okay. Oh, okay. That is God's, God's country by far. Well, you probably uh, went to school with my husband. So, um, oh, anyway, there you go. we'll talk later. Uh, I would like to open it up to the crew if there's anything specific for James or if you'd like more explanation. Um, I know I was riveted, but uh, can someone help me out here with uh, a question? It's, it's a very, uh, it can be a complicated discussion or a simple discussion. And that's, that's kind of the key to it. And, I mean, I'll, I'll, I can continue to ramble on a little bit if you like, but that's not a problem. I'm usually told to be quiet, so I can just keep going. And going okay. Like bunny. Boom, 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 okay, well, boom. well hold that, that thought, and I'll have a look at the room and see if there's anyone burning with something otherwise. Uh, Michelle's smiling. Is anything for you? Can I ask a question? Absolutely. I would like to ask the room, when you build a home, what air barrier do you use? Anyone building? Uh, perhaps one of the building inspectors can respond. What air barriers are being used out there? <laughs> Tyvek, yeah. Tyvek, I heard from one of the building inspectors. Okay, and so a lot of times I'll drive by and I, I kind of do this and I'm a little bit on the OCD side, a little bit crazy, but that's a different topic. Um, I see the, the Tyvek on the walls and all the vertical joints are taped. All right, and the thing about doing an envelope first is everything you do you need to answer the question why if you can't answer the why don't do the do until you know the why and so when somebody's up there tapes all the vertical joints on the tie back what's the air barrier for that building i'm asking i mean you're not talking to me so i'm going to talk to you okay <laughs> well, i'm asking if, I, if you if you drove by and you saw Tyvek on the building, and all the vertical joints were taped, what would the air barrier for that building be? Is it a trick question? Like it's, a, it's a thinking question, and the answer is PVD, right? And that doesn't mean peanut butter, okay? It means poly by default, because if you don't tape all the joints and everything on your Tyvek, it's not an air barrier. So the only other option they would have had is polyethylene on the inside, and it would all have to be sealed. Okay, so it, and it's about understanding those products and all the rest of it. And the part that's really, really challenging, do you need your air barrier? It's very, very hard. Yet somebody was up there on a pump jack or a lift or a scaffolding holding a roll of tape and tape the vertical. All they had to do is turn the tape and tape the horizontal, and you would have well on your way to an effective air barrier. And so this is the mindset and the thinking as, as you march down the, the step code highway is don't look at the material. Look at the control layer. And so when I'm teaching students in that, and we have all these different membranes in Tyvek, I never call it Tyvek. I'll call it the ABWRB, for air barrier, what is the barrier. And start naming things by their function. Once you do that, then the concept and deduction and understanding falls in place by osmosis. But if you drive by and say Tyvek, it's not Tyvek. It's the water resistant barrier first. If it's taped, now it's the water resistant barrier and an air barrier, okay? And that's the way you need to look at things. If you walk into a home and you see polyethylene on the walls, everybody knows right away, big barrier. We're like vapor barrier muppets, okay? We, we just know that, poly big barrier. Well, if the, you got building paper on the outside and poly on the inside, where's the air barrier? Is, it, is building paper an air barrier? No, it's not strong enough to be taped and sealed to take the pressure differentials and the pumping that's required of an air barrier material. So if you've got a hole with building paper, it becomes PVD again, poly by default. Okay? So you start to get this analysis tools in place, and anytime you walk up to a building, I mean, the code says you gotta have a continuous plane of air tightness. It's always said that. The only difference now is you're gonna test for it, and everybody becomes accountable. So it should have been done already. It's not done. The trade should have been doing it, but they're not doing it. And now that they're made accountable, it's a very good thing because it's supposed to have already been happening. And so that's the whole thing about step one is don't fear it, embrace it because it's the it's the um, learning step. It's a get out of jail free card where all you do is report and then learn 
Where did I perhaps go wrong? Do a smoke test. Talk to your energy advisor. Make sure your trades are present when you do your blower door test at mid construction. Because if you smoke the home like I do, and I take the trays around and you got smoke coming out various areas, right? That's automatic graphic learning. It's leaking at the roof to wall interface. The drywall's not on. Let's go have a look. What did we do wrong? Um, how do we make that connection? Imagine that you have to connect a roof to wall interface, okay? And when you build a traditional, you know, I'm just gonna use a standard residential home. You know, you put your basement, your first floor, your second floor, and you've got this box with no lid, right? And you've ordered the trusses, and they're coming. Well, before the trusses come, you can put that receiver tape that I have behind me on my mock-ups here, and put a ring of that around the top of your upper floor plywood and connect it to your plate. So when you drop the trusses on, you don't have to worry about your area because the connection's already made. It's called a receiver. And all you do is do your polyethylene on the inside. Now there's processes for doing that. When you put the poly flap on the partition walls between the two plates, okay? Wrap it around and just tack it down for six inches all the way around and put it on. Because now that ceiling poly can connect anywhere to that polyethylene. And that's what we're doing at the lab is I, I take the builders and the students and architects and whomever and say, this is how we build it traditionally. And we have the same tape and pooky and poly on the floor that you have. If I install it this way, it's airtime. If we install it the way it gets done now, which is lazy, piecemeal, got to make money, get it done, can you pay me now process, okay? You're not going to get performance. Okay, you can't put a, a BMW sticker on a Kia and tell me you got a Beamer. It's not happening. It's a Kia. And so you still have the same components. You put them all together better with better product materials, you just get better and better and better. And so imagine that you'd want to do the, the Tyvek around the window. One of the things that I'll do for a Tyvek, which would be the air barrier, water system barrier, is I've taught builders and, and they've called me back after and said, man, this rocks. Is, you know the rough opening size of your window. So that for, you know how big the stripping paper would need to be. You know how big the peel stick membrane and how that's done would need to be. So that means before I even build, I could cut and wrap every starter kit for my window and put it in a box called W1, W2, W3, W4. And I've done this with builders and I brought their entire project's window papers in a box and dropped it on the floor. And they just went with W1, that one, that would, and they just went and they rigged it all for the inside. When they stepped back to the curb a look later, every window was exactly the same, perfect, taped, and airtight. And the, the whole deal was, what costs as we move to the step floor? I, I asked this question, and here's, and, and, it, and this is a real passionate point for you because it drives me nuts, okay, and that's a short trip. So you get this all the time is, well, how much does it cost? How much does what cost? You don't even have a process to develop a cost. So you go buy the material, like some of the receiver tape, it costs 71 cents a foot, okay? But if I put that ring around the top of my plates that I talked about, if I had a home that's 40 by 60 by 40 by 60, that's 200 linear feet. It cost me $140 in tape to provide an effective air barrier transition from my roof to wall, which would cost me thousands of dollars to do in the later steps because in the later steps, as you go through the process, if you don't meet what you said you would, there's, and if you look at the energy step code, and even the step code for builders, there's a, a little dotted arrow that says, revise construction. There's where the fun starts, okay? So you're hoping to get occupancy and sell this thing, and you gotta go back and revise construction. Is that gonna cost more than $140 that you should have spent for the thing? Yeah. And so it's not about the price at Dick's or Standard or, or any a lumber yard store where you buy it. It's about the cost of getting it done from a holistic perspective. If you buy a material, let's say you put the insulation on the outside. Well, I no longer need poly and I don't need an insulation trade on the inside. Well, you got to measure that cost against what it takes to put it on the outside. If you're doing the insulation on the outside around the window, exactly the same plug-in pieces to make that drainage, work for every window. So I can cut all those pieces at a time, and I call them insulation headers to the windows. And I can plug them on. All you gotta do is pick them up and put on. You don't have to cut it, you don't have to do anything. So all this stuff, and, and the biggest thing to uh, cost and performance that I'm finding through the courses and the people I'm interacting with is trying to take prefabrication format 
and on-site stick build format and marrying them together. So where you can, you prefab, pre-make, pre-cut, bring to site. And you know, you ever watch somebody, and it's one of these things, I don't mean everybody, but you watch somebody, let's say put the, 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 the membrane around a window or walk around a site, walk all the way across, get a piece, come all the way back, get something else, walk all the way back, get something else. When all that could have been dropped in a box in your feet in front of the place they put it. So every step somebody's taken to go cut and get back, that's labor cost. Yeah. What costs in today's world? Labor. So if you could prefab as much as possible, bring it to site, tell them to stand still and put it on wall, you have a you know a, a funny process. I'm trying to be funny about it, but it's about the process and the concept. And it works really, really well. And people are getting like the one I talked about, the last builder I worked with, he you got know, 1.8. Uh, he thought he did exterior insulation the first time. We did exterior insulation on the foundation. So imagine you build a concrete foundation, okay? Which that's common, right? And so, and then what are we doing right now for the thermal value of the control layers and the concrete foundation? What's happening in your neighborhood right now? Are you doing a frame wall with poly and uh, bad insulation? I, I see some nods. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Thank <quiet>. you. <laughs> it's okay, but participation is way more fun. Um, <laughs> I do have a question after this. I have okay, and so when you, when you put the, the polyethylene and, and the bat on the inside, you basically have two vapor control layers because concrete is a vapor responder, okay? So if you do that, you're subject to convective looping and condensation. You know why basements smell musky? Well, at the upper part of the wall where you gotta leave eight inches or 200 millimeters of clearance from uh, cladding to grade, and let's say it's cold in Castlegar, which it happens once in a while, okay? Is, uh, so that concrete wall is really, really cold. So the air within that basement space, okay, it, the bad insulation is not intimate with the concrete. And I mean intimate with the concrete. It's just there. So you get air behind there. Well, that air gets cold. When cold, when air gets cold, it sinks. And when it sinks within that cavity space, it pushes warm air back up. And you get this little engine called a convective loop. And it puts a dampening all along the back side of the concrete wall. You don't see the ingress, and there's not water ingress. But there's condensation and wetting of the concrete, which now makes that lovely musty smell that you uh, live with forever. If you put the insulation on the outside of your concrete wall, because you've already dug a hole, it's very simple to do because there are processes for that, um, then that concrete wall on the inside doesn't need anything. You just have your frame wall, put your drywall. But the benefit is when you heat that room, that concrete absorbs that heat. When you turn the heat off, what does it do with that heat? It gives it back to you. Because the definition of insulation is resistance to heat flow. So if the concrete walls get warmed up, it's not going to let the heat flow out because heat flow is always warm and cold. Those are laws of physics. It's going to flow back into the room. So it seems like putting rocks all around your fireplace or whatever when you heat up the rocks so you get a little bit of warmer glow. You've now got a, a basement that's as fresh as your living room. Only because you moved the control layer. Go ahead with your question. Oh, wow. Thanks. Uh, it was to do with retrofits. I mean, we've been talking completely about new builds. Uh, is Are there some of these same concepts that can be applied to you retrofits? So and I can give you a simple one that applies to just about everyone. Okay? okay. Sure. Now, there's a couple of concepts that apply here. When you do a retrofit, if you could do it and achieve high performance and extreme comfort by reducing interior disruption, you probably check that box, right? right? Oh yeah, I gotta live in this stupid thing. I don't want you ripping my whole inside out, okay? Go outside and play. Let's go outside and play then. So you take off the existing cladding and you expose the, the sheathing. You can now, through the connections that I just talked to you about, I can now put an air barrier system on this home. Right, so I can reduce air loss by connecting to the concrete foundation, addressing my roof to wall interface. I can go up into my attic space. I'm still not in your house and I can look at the polyethylene that's on there. You can do flash and fill systems where you'll actually take a closed cell spray foam and you'll spray the attic and then pump back in new blown in, okay? So take out the old stuff, spray it, put a, a bat or blown on top of it, and you'll not only improve all your air tightness, you'll improve your uh, uh, R value and energy efficiency, but you still haven't gone in your building. You're still outside the building, okay? And so 
once I've gone to the outside of the building, a typical home that gets retrofit will use the same polyethylene uh, drywall or plaster, depending on age, uh, but the vapor control will be in the inside and there will be some kind of insulation in the studs. Fair, right? So that is something to build on. You can now add mineral wool on the outside because it's also vapor open and you've maintained that vapor drive to the outside. So I can add, and I've got mock-ups here where I got 12 inches of mineral wool on the outside, okay? And it's, that's an R48 wall. I could turn any house into an interfit home without even going inside except when I put the window in and the new trim around the inside. So you can live in the home with minimal disruption, but you do the work in the outside, the air barrier, the thermal barrier, the water system barrier, all that takes place on the outside. And to me, that's a, a retrofit approach that makes sense. And you, if you can only do part of your retrofit, then you leave it in a condition that you can tie into it when you continue later. Okay? And so it's actually very, very simple to plan a good retrofit um, after looking at what's there and taking the components off on the outside. You know, if you have a, a balcony and all these things, how do you get an air barrier through a balcony that's attached to your building? There's simple processes similar to what I did here with I use cement in the wood. I'll use the balcony wood in the balcony membrane as part of my air barrier transfer. All you have to do is have a plan. So PP, no HP, makes you happy, happy, happy. <laughs> Open a prayer right off that. Yeah, that's <laughs> not a good plan, right? No, no, gotta have a plan. Okay. Trish, Trish, can you hear me, Alex, here? Can hear, yes, I can hear yes. Alex. Okay. So just quickly, uh, James, to add to the plan uh, or planning piece, we're following a uh, retrofit right now that is removing an old furnace and installing a heat pump system. And, and, and it's, a, it's a bunch of smart people working together, but, mm -hmm. but there are no true plans in place. And, and there's not a good understanding from the mechanical contractor of what the air barrier is. And so if you don't even know which layer is your air barrier as a, as, a, as a mechanical contractor going through the walls with penetration for your refrigeration uh, lines and so on, then whatever it is you're trying to do from an air tightness point of view will disappear uh, very quickly. So the plan has to go as far as including yep. uh, all the substrates, whether it's electrical, mechanical, and so on. And also, if you're doing a, a, a retrofit like you talked about, maybe you're gonna integrate heat recovery. Heat recovery is just a common sense no-brainer. Uh, you heat it up air and you're going to discharge it. Well, you might as well drive down the highway and throw 20s out the window. Okay, that's about as effective, okay? So, recover the heat. Keep your money. Yeah, there's a good line. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Okay, how are we doing over here? They, they uh, are listening. Oh, there's a question. question. Um, are those guys doing, uh, can you guys hear me? Or do you need to translate? I have trouble with the hearing yeah. on that. Um, embodied carbon, are they looking uh, at that within like the retrofit and the new materials and stuff? Embodied, ca embodied carbon, uh, are, are you looking at that with to do with retrofits or new builds? But embodied carbon is... Yeah, there's, there's a strong push towards all that. Um, and it, it's kind of a embodied carbon is the question. I don't yeah. think you can hear that, right? Um, yeah, you could use uh, wood insulations. Wood is a, a great way to address that. Um, the mineral wool is uh, reusing the slag or waste product of steel production, so recycling that material. And, and I find that um, if you can build an efficient building, you're going to reduce carbon footprint anyway. Okay, so there's a there's a there's a middle ground. You can build with this full embodied hug a tree concept, not a problem, but Again, not really practical. You start putting a lot of organics on the outside. Um, you got to look at things like mold uh, potential, depending on where you're doing this. If you're in a dry, cold climate, you might be fine. And I'm all for embodied carbon, but I'm also for stepping back and keeping a holistic view and not just staring down a rabbit hole because someone might poke you in the eye. Okay? So just check it out and yeah, be aware of the carbon part of it like uh, foam plastics and all the rest of it, probably there's a combustibility factor there. Imagine if you do that on the outside and it catches fire. Fire won't kill you, the toxic smell will, and the fumes. And so these are things to think about. Mineral wool, I think, is a wonderful product, in my mind, because of its non-combustibility. But the other ones provide a slightly better, you know, 
or one improvement per inch, um, but they are combustible. There's polyisocyanurates, which are heat resistant, can be used. EPS can be used on the outside. Um, EPS and diesel, that's the ingredients for napalm. I don't know if that's exactly the, the best thing you want to be playing with, but at the end of the day, these are the facts. Okay? And so you make these decisions, right? I don't write this stuff, this is just already documented, okay? So. We can hear oh. you, but you got an ambulance going on, but we can hear you. Oh, I think it was, it was a, a, it was a portrait as a. Oh, oh, it was a scissor lift. Uh, okay. I, I'll do my rotos at. Okay. So, um, the embodied carbon is an important uh, consideration. I, we all need to reduce our carbon footprint here, okay? We need to reduce our energy now. We can't sustain what we're doing, okay? As we move forward, the demand, we won't be able to meet it anymore. And I think as long as you build an enclosure that is net zero ready, which means you can put PV panels and you can sustain your own, okay? And if you have a good envelope, you're not gonna need to burn a lot of gas. You know, you, all of a sudden you got a 6,000 BTU unit to help you once in a while, okay? Uh, if you need that, uh, you've been away and you want to warm up your house quickly. But otherwise, you're not going to be using a lot of energy. And be careful with the lead programs and all this stuff where you get all these points. There's four Ds, okay? And the one that comes into play with all these concepts is durability, okay? So you have deflection. That's the most powerful. If you deflect things away, they don't bother you. If you have drainage, drainage and drying, you don't have any issues. The whole thing about enclosure and building science is always maintain a balance between wetting and drying. If your drying potential is greater than your wetting, you win. If you think buildings don't get wet, you're delusional. Of course they get wet. There's always minor condensation and little things that happen, but you don't know about it because your drying potential is huge. That's why split insulated and insulation ratio are important because there is the need for some drying potential no matter what. And so that's where all this comes into play. And so just make the next best decision. Understand the concepts. Uh, and build an energy efficient home where you don't produce any carbon. Yeah, there's carbon put in to produce this, but the durability means your home will last, if you build a curious lit home, it'll last 500 years, okay? It's, there's nothing to go wrong. You've wrapped your, how long would a piece of two by four if you put it on your kitchen table last? As long as your house did, okay? Yeah. Right? So, if your house is wrapped, it's, what's going to hurt? It's going to hurt it. How long does they have wood buildings that are thousands of years old? Okay, I'm Danish in my heritage, you know. We got some really old funky wood buildings that they're still there. So yeah. James, uh, James and Trish, I guess, uh, Alex here, um, we're probably out of time. Like I don't have my watch uh, in front of me, but I'm guessing it's yeah. been two minutes to 11. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, Trish, is maybe do a bit of a shameless, uh, shameless plug here. Uh, James is uh, uh, one of our lead instructors in the programs here. Uh, there's a course uh, that starts October 6th. Uh, you'll spend two evenings with James looking at air tightness. Uh, so if you're interested, you can search. It's a course uh, labeled 1110. Uh, and then James is coming back with another instructor uh, in late October, again for two evenings, uh, Tuesday nights, uh, to do a deeper dive around split insulation uh, and details around balconies, uh, roofs, windows, penetration, and so on. And what you're getting if you register to this course is a, we're adding a bonus lecture. It's a two, two hour night with uh, Chris Magwood from the Endeavor Center in Peterborough. Uh, it's going to be live with us online, and he does his entire two-hour lecture on embodied carbon and life cycle assessment of your envelope. And what I find really interesting is I spent so much time with James uh, over the last uh, two years. Uh, listening to Chris was interesting because he was repeating a lot of what James was saying, uh, showing you what materials could be selected if your, your thing or your municipality is saying embodied carbon is, is a priority now. And, and what's interesting is the concepts are all the same. You know, nothing changed, the plan stays the same, but you have to pick materials based on, 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 on their carbon content. But that's also part of what you get if you uh, register to the uh, 1120 course. So the two courses coming up is 1110 and 1120. It's all online, uh, all broadcasted from the lab, except for Chris Magwood, who's broadcasting from uh, Peterborough. That's a great and plug, so, and we have we have the poster, right? You gave it to awesome, us the poster, awesome. so they all they all have awesome. a copy. And awesome. so we do demonstrations, 
uh, question and answer periods, uh, look at process. How can you make put this as part of your process uh, in a cost-effective manner and a responsible manner? And how do you get the message to your trades? Well, you could send them to these classes. That would be a good start. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, right now the uh, the builders need to get continued professional development points, but the builders don't do the work. And so it's up to the builders to pass the information. But a lot of, a lot of them don't know how to swing a hammer; they swing a checkbook. So how are you going to get the trades the information so there's a disconnect? Uh, it's a responsibility of the builders to make that connection. Either you send your preferred trades to for the education, or what I suggest to builders is build a mock-up wall before you do your build. Okay, and we do that a lot of high courts. Well, we'll build an eight by ten wall with a window penetration and, and maybe one other penetration and build it, and all everybody will look at it, and that helps with the pricing. And if you understand it, I mean, how can you ask somebody to price something when they don't know how they're going to do it? I think you're not going to get very good pricing. Right? And so you tell your contractor, oh yeah, we're going to put six inches of this lake on the outside. And he's going to price that based on what? Yeah. He's going to, should just say, five, that's what. He doesn't know. I don't know why. I'm going to throw some money at it and make sure I don't lose money. Well, then you say it's too expensive. And that's why I say you can't develop costs until you have process. And that's what the mock up wall is about, is throwing that process. And I can show very simply how you can pre manufacture most of those components and bring them to the site, install it. That's quick. Well, I think over. we're right at 11, so I think you you got to go to your next show, I think, Jane. Uh, apparently, I, I need to put on a different dancing outfit <laughs> and do it again, yeah? Well, uh, this was a fabulous hour and a half. We feel like you're right here with us. Uh, and That's excellent. Lots of smiles. Thank you. A big thank you to you and your team at CEA, and uh, a big thank you to the team uh, with the city. We uh, we spent a few minutes together on Friday to kind of make sure we we knew how the IT worked, and that was really useful for us. So thanks to both groups for uh, organizing this. It was great. Yeah. We'll do it again. And uh, yeah, I'm 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 tempted by the course, James. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, see you there. Okay. And I just okay. did a course last weekend. Uh, of course, last weekend, and I had a builder from Castlegar take the experience later wall course. Oh, so, good to know. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, so um, the fire's been lit. Okay, and we'll, be, we'll, we'll, hot dogs. we'll definitely be promoting this to the Castlegar builders. And yeah, and take it slow, take it simple, embrace step one. It's an opportunity to learn a process without penalty. Okay? Don't fear it. Let's save some carbon. Let's build some cool homes. Hardy, hardy. Okay? <laughs> Okay, adieu. Okay, thank oh, you very much. Okay, bye, bye. Thank bye. you. Super, I'm super stoked to hear that um, the BCIT that they're BCIT course they're offering is with Chris Magwood because he was actually the fellow that got me into this whole line of work. I took a six month sustainable construction program with him, and he is awesome and super super smart and has such a holistic approach to sustainable building. So if anyone is considering that course, highly recommend it. Um, yeah, so I'm Michelle, work for 3 West Energy Consulting based out of Nelson. We serve kind of all the Central Kootenai area. Um, and yeah, just here today to kind of put a face to a name and just give you a bit of a sense about what it's like to work with an energy advisor. So what's an EA anyway? Uh, we covered a bit of this, but basically I'm certified through Natural Resource Canada. They have a bunch of coursework and exams and some sample modeling projects that you have to do to become certified. And that takes about six months to go through that process, but definitely having a background in some kind of construction, uh, sustainable construction field is super useful. Um, and then we get certified, we use the, the modeling software we use is called Hot 2000, which was built, made back in the 80s. I'm pretty sure when year 2000 was like the deep future. Um, so that's the software we use and it actually works really well for what it is, like you could get really fancy modeling software that you're putting like 10, 15 grand into getting an assessment done, but this program we use is simple, straightforward, gets the information that we need, and I think is good to be so widely applied for step code. So I think it's a good piece of software to use. Um, and yeah, our background has to be quite varied. We have to know a lot about a lot of different stuff, so construction methods and materials, um, 
yeah, building science, mechanical systems, design considerations. So there's a lot that goes into it and a lot that I'm constantly learning. So uh, that's why I really like the job. Um, and this we've already touched on too, but this is kind of why an extra person needs to be brought into the mix is because the building code is moving from prescriptive, which is just tick box, two by six walls, efficient, the sufficiency of your furnace. We're moving into performance space, which is how everything works together. And I think what's cool about that is it actually gives a little bit more flexibility. So in some cases, um, if you have a whole wall of north facing glazing, which would have a lot of heat loss, we can say, okay, that we'll keep that. You want your view? We'll just add a bit more insulation to the exterior or to the attic, and we can actually do a bit of give and take. So we're looking at, and, and you can only really do that by looking at how everything interacts together. So um, I think it's, yeah, to be able to actually show how a house performs is super important. And I think a, a, a key piece that, yeah, should have kind of been in the mix long ago, I think. And so my process basically from start to finish is I like to get involved as soon as possible, kind of once the building plans exist and the geometries are basically set. Um, then to get me involved is great because lots of times, especially now in Nelson where step one is required and someone, a builder will call me up and say, we just put in for our permit and we're going to, we want to break ground, ground as soon as possible. Like here's the plans. And it's like, okay, is this going to take me a bit of time to do? And it's nice to have a little bit more flexibility so that we can discuss different assembly details and maybe different, uh, window placement and stuff like that and so it's great if I can be involved when things are still a bit flexible and we still have time to consult through that process um, and then I make an energy model based on those building plans based on the provided specs and then that will tell me what the current step code rating is and then I can also provide recommendations to show ways you could get to higher step code ratings or or meet the minimum if that's what's required and then also what's really great uh, along the way is if builders or homeowners can send me details once things get finalized. So if you figure out what your window quote is or your specific heat pump unit or whatever, send it to me. I can punch in all the specifics and say, okay, yeah, you're still on track. Um, and then, yeah, and once I'm done my initial model, that's when I, if step code is required, I just complete my paperwork. It's just standardized for the province, just one form, and I send it in to the uh, authority having jurisdiction, and then that's how you know on the building official side, okay, yeah, this is step one, we can move the permit process along. And I'm kind of small, but this is what my recommendation report will look like. So I'll put in all the general specs in the model, and then um, depending on what the client is looking for, I can give different options for achieving higher step code ratings. And sometimes it's just even out of interest. It's like, okay, what really happens if we put double glaze versus triple glaze? What happens if we add one and a half inches of exterior insulation versus two. So we don't have to deal with that in the abstract. Now we can actually figure out, okay, what is the actual energy difference when we model these different scenarios? And so then you can kind of clearly lay out, this is just all the different building specs. So if you use this, 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 you'll get step three. So then we can play around with a bunch of different options. And then the other on-site piece of it is the blower door testing. So that's what I'll come and do as well. There's two options for uh, doing blower door testing throughout the build. So one is the mid-construction test, which is optional at this point, but definitely uh, if you're aiming for those higher step code ratings, it's definitely recommended. I've seen some crazy things at mid-construction tests. Uh, so this would be when the air barrier is complete, but before drywall goes up and while you still have a chance to access any leaks and stuff that might be there. I've seen like spray foam that kind of bubbled up and didn't fill and you could literally like I could stick my whole arm through it and you could see daylight outside and just like stuff you don't think of unless you're really hunting it out and when I have the fan running we can run around the house and you can actually put your hand up anywhere and you can feel air blasting in where leaks are so uh, that one's super informative and then you kind of know you're on track if you're trying to get to step five it's pretty stringent standard so you want to kind of have like a bit of peace of mind that you're on track so that's a good thing to do and then the one that isn't optional is the final blower door test and that's like at end of everything pretty much like at occupancy stage and then I just come into the build we don't have to tape anything up or do anything basically just shut the HRV off shut the heat off and I set up my fan and then that 
score is what your official air tightness rating is for the house. And then, yeah, we've gone over this too, but I just think it's awesome that we're just attending up so much money right now. And if you get to even step two, that pretty much more than doubles the cost of my services. So even for places that aren't step code mandatory yet, it's like, well, you get an assessment done of your house, you know your step code rating, you get money back. So I think it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, and then, yeah, there's this design offer that Fortis, Fortis is offering as well which is a little bit more vague, but basically if we sign a client up for this program early, early on, um, they can get up to seven grand back for working with a mechanical consultant or an envelope consultant. And basically they just send in their receipts afterwards. So um, that's a really key piece is that, um, yeah, the, the mechanical systems especially is something, you know, like we have this step five building that is designed and sizing and balancing and, uh, the, making sure the HVAC equipment matches the performance of that house is super key, so getting a mechanical expert involved is a cool idea. And then just a little bit of what I've learned in the last uh, just year and a bit of doing this job, um, and I do projects in Nelson, but all over the Kootenays and Castlegar and Rossland and Grant Forks and all over the place, and First thing that I've really seen is builders are already excelling at air tightness like crazy. Like I go onto sites and some are already above and beyond step five for air tightness and they're like, oh, we just kind of do what we normally do when they just think they have good attention to detail. They plan, but they're not doing anything super crazy. And yeah, I'm just amazed so far at builders that are yeah just excelling at this already. So that's super encouraging to see. Um, and yeah, also learning that no two buildings are alike, so there's no, I, this is why it's performance based, but there's no checklist for like, how do I get to step four? Um, there's so many different things that determine a building's performance. Lots of it is low grade area, your ori orientation, your climate zone, stack effects, so there's all this stuff that comes into play. Um, so yeah, keeping that building design simple as possible like the less kind of jobs and bump outs and crazy stuff happening the easier it is to have that solid efficient building shape and then maybe you can get to step four with just double glazed windows and so it's like that give and take again um and yeah I, I definitely see that it's easy for most builds to get to at least step two with really without doing anything above and beyond and so i think that's uh a good place to start and to get everyone's confidence up that like yes the new construction that we're doing is already pretty dang good and now that's just being confirmed really um, and the last thing is just that BC is really paving the way nationally and globally and I think by being leaders and innovators there are some definite growing pains along the way and people having to adjust to new ways of doing things and things not working out. We've already had a few kind of shifts in the way we measure step code metrics because it's like, okay, that's not totally fair. Let's rethink it. So it does take patience on this end, but I think that's what it takes to be a leader in this realm. Yeah, so basically just to summarize, I think the key to adjusting to these growing pains is doing what we're doing today, which is collaborating and supporting and having really good communication between all the folks that are involved on a project. Um, and if you have any questions about any of this at any time or anything to do with green building, I love to chat about that stuff. So um, I have some cards here if anyone wants or our, our company's Three West and we have a website and stuff you can check out. And yeah, uh, if anyone has any questions right now, happy to answer. Questions? Yeah. So if you're just going to follow the prescriptive rules for insulation and windows, and it's have really good air tightness, but the step code level would that you, or do you have to go more than prescriptive? To oh, well, I see a lot of builds that get to step two, step three without doing like two by, they just have two by six walls, R22 bats, like gas furnace, double glazed windows. That's it. It's just, a lot of it does depend on those other things. like. Is that south facing glazing? How, how much area is below grade? What's the shape? So that's when those other key pieces start to come into play. But you can for sure get above step one by just those yeah, code minimum prescriptive requirements. No one else? All right, well, thank you, everyone.
And will you, would you be able to share those slides with us? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, um, that brings us to the 11.30. Like, look at that. Last uh, half hour for this session, which was intended to be a um, the, the Castlegar process. And so we'll probably bring Mary back up for that. Before she did, it made me think of the sustainability checklist of what you just talked about. Uh, and this whole sort of plan, you can't, you know, you can't build without a plan and the planning process. And one thing that we have developed over the years at the regional district level, and I think Castlegar is using it as well, is an information piece that we call the sustainability checklist but it was to be giving out at the counter when people are thinking about what's the zoning of my property, what, what am I gonna build? And just think early on some of the things to think about, you know, south facing and working with an energy advisor and all those. So, so we do have a checklist to encourage people in the early process of their buildings to work with an energy advisor to have an integrated design process. Now we've got some amazing uh, rebates from Fortis available at this point in time. And those rebates, as I've already said, will not last forever. And they're, they're geared at helping us move towards what's going to happen in 2022 when the building code has changed and then those rebates will not be available. So I think um, I've spoken enough right now. <laughs> Is there, uh, I, I guess, Miri, do you want to, should we do some discussion about the rollout of, of the step code here in the city? Um, I already kind of touched You've done on that. that. So um, Trish is right. Uh, so we do have a lot of information at our building counter as well. So uh, when we hand out building permits, we hand out the sustainability checklist as well as uh, just a handout on step code and how to get a hold of an energy advisor. Um, yeah, uh, Castlegar is already committed to step one. Uh, I'm working on the building bylaw. Um, so not so much relevant to those in the room right now, but for those in the room tomorrow, <laughs> There is a online survey to assess uh, the building community's uh, readiness um, because we're not just looking at step code implementation, we're also looking at integrating a retrofit uh, program as well as EV charging. So um, we haven't drafted the bylaw because we want to make sure that before we put it into a regulatory framework that our builders are ready for it. Um, so yeah, if people are excited and they want to respond to the survey online, they can. Uh, all the information is in your information packages. And other than that, I think as long as we are wearing masks, because we're a small group, I was thinking we could probably start rolling through the assembly units. Yeah, and I guess just before we finish, we do that, we do, we do have a feedback form yeah. Somehow we'll which is in, like okay yeah, the package and their packages as well. So we yeah. really like to hear your feedback about today. I, personally, I thought it went really well, and I think this might be a model we can use in other communities. But um, we like your feedback on that. Don't let yeah. Me, don't and, let and me definitely know. post COVID if people want to take a road trip to the innovation lab and play with all the assemblies. I'm totally there. <laughs> I was nerding out going, that would be like the funnest room to just play in for a full day, just like run around playing with assemblies. Um, but they probably don't let you do that, but maybe we could ask permission. They, they do if you arrange it, like if you contact them and kind of book it in, they'll let you go play. See, I'm all over that. So post-COVID road trip from the Kootenays to Vancouver to play in BCIT, you're all invited. <laughs> and Mary and... Alex, who we worked with on this, there are people to get well, up this. Well, place. there you go. I will rent a little like passenger <laughs> van and pack us all in. So yeah, I I don't know if K10 can speak to the model at all. We we can't. There are sheets there. You guys are builders, uh, and probably can have a look. But yeah, let's just 
just treat it like. So the wall assemblies have information sheets that are with them here. And when you go to Hamid's blog, Hamid Design Build, his blog has these sheets as well as with all of the roof assemblies. There's the pros and the cons and, and um, why one would stand out over another. And all of that information is available online. And Mary also has the PDFs of those documents that she can share with you. So you're welcome to take a look at those in, in more depth and, and have that available to yourself, to your group. Yeah, so I, I will send those technical booklets out to everybody who was here and was unable to attend as well, because there's a lot of council members and staff that are at the airport right now. Um, so um, I would invite people to walk through, try to maintain your social distance as much as you can. Um, the other thing for building officials who wanted to participate in the construction of the assemblies is maybe while you're going through, make a note of which three or four you think we as a group could tackle uh, in October. Um, so like try to keep it as basic as possible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding. Yeah, but choose the ones that might be good for your own Yeah, display. like choose the ones that you feel like when you're in the field are the most appropriate for our area um, and the most easy for a building community to kind of uh, achieve. And it would be nice if you picked from a variety, like one roof assembly, one wall assembly, right? And, and worked our way through, um, because these will be packed back up and heading back to the East Kootenays um, tomorrow afternoon. Um, but we may borrow or hang on to the assemblies we wanna hang on to so we can use them as a template for our own assemblies. So um, just keep that in the back of your heads as you're going through. If one stands out and you go like, this is the most skookum wall assembly I've ever seen, maybe just mark down which one. Something that always comes up in our workshops when we use these assemblies, we get the feedback forms. And, uh, key learnings that lots of builders have picked up on are the importance or the utility of the exterior air barrier, and then that allowing the service cavities. And so I've had a builder in Fernie tell me that they have adopted having these service cavities in their ceilings and their walls and how much easier their process was going. Um, so if I was gonna put in a plug for something you were gonna pick, maybe one of the, the ones that have the service cavities and allow you to do all that work with um, <clears throat> easily might be one of them that you like. You guys can pick your own, but that's always something that comes up. So this would be the one with the that's the window one, and then there's several other ones that have the possibility to have all of your your pipes and tubes and all of your other things that I don't have the words for <laughs> uh, it, within the service cavities that are easy to repair and access, and et cetera. Yeah, so, so basically we're plugging that the building officials with experience in construction should be the ones picking which is not because people like me will just go, hmm, that looks pretty, <laughs> and set it to the side. <laughs> just, okay. Just do plumbing partitions instead of uh, exterior walls. Much easier. Plumbing partitions. Do we have one of those here? I guess. Aside from this one, maybe. I mean, if you're, uh, you know, line up your bathroom or whatever. So that you, you can have one one six, two by six wall. Uh, okay. I think I'm understanding that. <laughs> well, feel free to move your ways through. And I think I think basically that we'll call this a wrap. And you or yeah, we won't, we won't be convened after this. I don't think so. Um, I think. Paul, you already kind of covered the, you know, there's lots of online educational opportunities right now in this field, um, especially, I actually think more so than ever before because COVID has forced people to provide information in a new way. So I would encourage everybody to take advantage of that because I'm sure when this pandemic has wrapped up that those kind of opportunities will probably disappear quickly. Um, so um, yeah, I just encourage everybody to, all the information for them is in your information package. So 
just have a look and fit in what you can within your schedule uh, for those who need the professional uh, development credits anyway. Oh yeah, we can arrange any CPD credits for today. Yeah. Yeah. And then further to that, if you guys like the RDC guys and Kassigar and for Nelson and everyone, like just reach out if there's anything you see interesting, uh, training wise or learning opportunities or anything, just reach out and we'll do our best to like see if we can facilitate that. Um, and that might be something for those feedback forms that we really would like to hear. Yeah. Yeah, and I can email the feedback forms as well after this to everybody who is here and those who couldn't make it um, because that will help guide uh, future opportunities. So um, we do have some funding from Fortis Species Built Better uh, program right now. And so the regional district was successful in obtaining funding. We were, I believe Nelson was, maybe Creston. No, just the two of us. Okay, so just the two of us, <laughs> but we, I, you know, I don't mind sharing <laughs> and, and uh, our funding share. by inventing, like inviting Creston and Nelson um, staff as well to all these training opportunities. So if you know of uh, things you really want to focus on, whether that's air tightness or the, you know, the mechanical end of things, then let us know because we can arrange. Um, shared opportunities amongst the two of us so yeah. well and i'll just put the plug in for community energy association right now too and we can maybe help facilitate some of that and it has been our pleasure and thank you very much gate 10 for carton driving all, all this way. over the pass and castle produced a beautiful day for you so um yeah thank you very much for and yeah please please have a look <laughs>